is, of course, an attempted coup in Turkey. The this is a highly fluid situation uh, across all of Turkey. An attempted military coup in Turkey. On the 15th of July 2016, an event changed Turkey forever. Thousands of members of the military and security forces tried to stage a coup. More than 250 people were killed and more than 2,000 injured. Airstrikes pounded parliament, targeting political and military figures. Both bridges across the Bosphorus were seized. So was the national broadcaster. And a team was sent to find the Turkish president at his hotel in the resort of Marmaris. And when the coup failed, Recep Tayyip Erdogan knew who was responsible. <laughs> That man is Fethullah Gulen. He's been living in the United States since 1999, and the Turkish authorities say he runs a criminal organization. We've uncovered new evidence against the main suspects. We've investigated how they've been linked to Fethullah Gulen, how the Turkish authorities believe that he has been calling the shots, and we'll show you first-hand accounts of how his organization operates. This is Fethullah Gulen talking to two children at his compound in the United States. And on the far right of the screen is a man called Adil Uxas. In 2016, he was an assistant professor at Sakarya University, 150 kilometers from Istanbul, and also one of Gulen's closest associates. Ragip Soylu is a Turkish journalist who has been following the investigations. He was many times pictured, you know, videotaped with Fethullah Gülen himself in Pennsylvania. And, and he was uh, pictured attending many conferences on Fethullah Gülen specifically. And in the same time, in his close circles in, in Sakarya, where he used to live, he was known Gülenist. This is Adil Uxas praying with Gülen in the 1990s, when he still lived in Turkey. And here he is at a conference about Gülen in Albania in 2012. Just before the coup attempt, Uxa's salary was about $1,500 a month. Yet between 2002 and 2016, he travelled abroad 109 times. In the two years before the coup attempt, he travelled 12 times, including these flights, at least four times to New York. The last was business class on July the 11th, 2016. New York is about an hour and a half's drive from Gulen's home in Pennsylvania. Uxas returned to Turkey two days before the coup. Also on that same final flight to and from New York was this man, Kemal Batmaz. He and Uxas had traveled together to the US before. And on a trip earlier in 2016, Batmaz told US passport officials he would stay with Gulen. Batmaz had been an executive of Kainak Holding, a well-known Gulenist company. He was also director of its media agency, seen here in one of its corporate videos. Very similar to Scientology in the United States and other uh, religious cults in the United States, uh, Fethullah Gulen organization has also many different corporations and media arms to operate, uh, make profit, and at the same time, you know, use this power to infiltrate in the government bodies to shape their agenda. So Kaina Coding was one of them, and a very well-known organization connected to the Gulen movement. Both Uxas and Batmaz were caught together on security camera at Istanbul's Atatürk airport, returning from New York two days before the coup. Batmaz later denied knowing who Uxas was, but following the coup attempt, they were both arrested at the same location, at the heart of the action. Behind this fence is what used to be Akinja Air Base. It's about 30 kilometers away from the capital Ankara, and it's alleged that it was used as the main command center for the whole coup operation. Kamal Batmaz was caught on security camera inside the base on the night of the coup attempt. 
a man with no obvious military connections, walking around unsupervised, talking to senior officers. Both he and Uxas were arrested, trying to escape Akinja Air Base the following morning. Uxas, who also had no clear military links, was in a group of men who climbed over this fence. He was detained and later tried to dispose of a GPS device while visiting the bathroom. Both he and Batmaz had the same alibi, that they were in the area looking for land to buy. As did this man, Harun Binish. He's a computer engineer who worked for an affiliate of Kainak Holding. He was also seen in the airbase on security cameras. It's just insane that these people, all of them were captured in early morning. And, and the coup attempt is ongoing in, inside the country. People, like some people in some parts of Istanbul, they just, you know, raided ATM machines just to take the money or, you know, just um, getting food because they were afraid that the coup would, would, would be succeeding. And then they would need food because there would be, you know, um, a ban on get, get, getting into street and, you know, they will be just like uh, stuck at homes and won't be able to get anything at all. But these people, how courageous they are, they're just out there near a military base where planes are taking off every minute and they're just looking for a farmland to purchase. They're just insane. I mean, there is no logical explanation to this at all. Subsequently, Kamal Batmaz and Harun Binish were put on trial, but Adil Uxas wasn't. He was separated from the other suspects, released and hasn't been seen since. This man, Chetin Sunmez, was the judge who set him free. He was later jailed for eight years and nine months for being a Gulenist. Akunja's importance to the plot was evident by what happened to the head of the Turkish military. He was detained by soldiers involved in the coup, an event captured on security camera. Hulusi Akar, who later became defense minister, was taken to the airbase the place from where many of the airstrikes were coordinated. Akar said in his evidence that his captors had offered to put him in contact with Gulen. The Air Force was very important uh, during the coup attempt. And uh, the, all the operations, you know, the, the planes, the jets, who bombarded the, the, the Grand National Assembly or the Turkish presidency, they all just took off from the Akinci Air Base. And secondly, um, as you know, the, the coup plotters also kidnapped the uh, general staff of Turkish army. Um, and then they took them, not only the most senior ones, but even, even the like mid-level uh, officers, um, you know, blindfolded and, and uh, handcuffed, and they took them to Akinci Air, Air Base. So like that was the area that they felt the safest. and. Um, it was very clear for Hulusi Akar, who is now the Turkish defense minister, who was also kidnapped as the most senior officer in the army, uh, that was the epicenter of the coup attempt because all the operations were organized and ordered uh, in the airbase. During the coup attempt, soldiers also tried to take over the media. A group entered TRT's headquarters in Ankara and forced the presenter to read a statement. It was from the Peace at Home Council, the body claiming responsibility for the coup attempt. Bu metnin tüm Türkiye Cumhuriyeti kanallarında yayımlanması Türk Silahlı Kuvvetlerinin bir emridir. Turkish journalist Hande Firat was working at CNN Turk at the time of the coup attempt. She managed to get the Turkish president on air using social media. He then called for people to take to the streets in protest. Milletime de bir çağrı yapıyorum. O da şudur. Milletimizi illerimizin meydanlarına davet ediyorum. Havalimanlarına davet ediyorum ve milletçe meydanlarda havalimanında toplanalım ve bunların o azınlık grubu tanklarıyla toplarıyla gelsinler. Ne yapacaklarsa halka orada yapsınlar. Halkın gücünün üstünde bir güç ben tanımadım bugüne kadar. The Gülenist organization was already well known to her. In the military, a Supreme Military Council meeting was going to take place. We all already knew that, and after this meeting, Gülen followers in the Turkish Armed Forces were going to be expelled. 
So that night after the uprising, our sources started to say to us that it was those soldiers who were expecting to be expelled that were behind the uprising. Our sources from the military, who have no connection with Gulen, said that Gulenists were attempting a coup and this was out of the chain of command. So that night it was crystal clear that this coup attempt was underway by the Gülenists in the Turkish armed forces. As the coup plotters continued to try to take over the media, soldiers were accompanied by IT specialists at each media venue they targeted. This video shows three of them, all of whom worked for Gülen affiliated companies escaping over the fence at TRT's Ulus branch in Istanbul the morning after the coup attempt. Nusret Argun is a businessman from the Turkish city of Konya. In 2008, he was at the head of a group of companies supplying gas to 31 cities. He was rich and powerful, managing lucrative contracts, but also an opponent of the Gulenists. Within months, he was in jail after being framed for fraud and financial malpractice. Nusret Argun spent almost six years in prison before he was released and cleared. And when he came out, he lodged a complaint with the organized crime unit in Konya. And the investigation that followed revealed more than ever before how this organization that claimed to promote education and interfaith dialogue was trying to manipulate the legal system and all aspects of life in the city. The investigation led from Argun to Memdu Oz, a lawyer from Konya who subsequently went on the run. He'd been planning a trip abroad with his assistant, who was carrying $120,000 in 10 different currencies. Investigators found documents linking him to US politics, a list of 325 Gulenists in Konya and a list of 4,000 people they were responsible for. By interviewing these people, officials were able to work out just how they operated and how the organization stretched further than previously realized. Hanafi Avja is a former police chief who also served a prison sentence. He was framed by Gulenists after warning officials about their activities and then writing a best-selling book about them. He has experience of how the organization can manipulate the legal system. In those days, the Gulen list aimed to capture the intelligence and police departments because they had the right to make judicial and political investigations. First, they infiltrated the intelligence, counter-terrorism and organized crime departments in the Directorate General of Security in Ankara and the police headquarters in Istanbul. In parallel, they also had members who were prosecutors and judges. Once they captured these two important authorities, they got a chance to do whatever they wanted with the help of fake documents prepared by the police, inquiries by Gulenist prosecutors, and decisions taken by their judges. Nobody could speak against them because they had captured the judiciary and they made great propaganda with the help of their media. The structure discovered in Konya was replicated throughout the country, with a network of so-called imams to manage each area of activity. There was one in charge of the whole of Turkey. There's also one each for Turkey's seven provinces, one each for its 81 cities, and then one for each district in each city, and so on. This is then replicated in areas such as business, education, the military and other professions. Apparently normal people holding down normal jobs, but in which their identity as a Gulenist imam is hidden from public view. If you are part of this structure, it's unlikely you will know just how large it is, because you will only know those immediately above and below you, and even then, false names are used. You can have these people, so-called imams for judiciary, you know, air force, uh, ground forces, you know, navy, you would have imams for the interior minister, you have imams for the minister of education, you would have imams in provinces, you would have like, you know, Istanbul branch of uh, national education ministry having an imam, you would have 
uh, you know, the, the local airbase having an imam. So they have this a parallel hierarchy, as the Turkish state used to call them, parallel, parallel state, because they have, a, they have a parallel hierarchy. They would grant orders to these people and they would follow that parallel hierarchy rather than the official line. It was also through information gathered here in Konya that they discovered Gulenist members who recruited and fundraised but were officially employed in companies in jobs that didn't exist. They also discovered how they used a network of houses across the country, how they would use the same cars to make journeys and how they would use mobile phones to call each other but only using code names and it's from this information that they discovered more links between Adil Uxas, Kamal Batmas and other leading members of the organization. Education was also particularly important to the organization. This is Mevlana University in Konya. It was run by the Gulenist Network and was closed down a few days after the failed coup. Its schools and universities were used to select bright students, give opportunities to the poor and integrate them into the organization. Turkey had these prep schools that prepare uh, Turkish students to high schools and the university exams and they were very um, impactful in a way because the regular high schools and, and the regular middle schools didn't prepare students enough for these exams. So they had to go through these special educational activities, you know, granted by largely uh, Gulen movement or, and the Gulen organization, whatever you call it. And then once they recruit you, mostly they place you in a house because many students who are, you know, uh, getting inside high schools or colleges, they are not uh, staying in, in their hometowns. So they, for example, a student either would just end up in Istanbul and probably he wouldn't have anyone in Istanbul. He would, some, he would need somewhere to stay. He would some, you know, um, financial aid. Sometimes, you know, he would need uh, moral, uh, you know, support. Uh, some people to show him how to, you know, basically survive in Istanbul. So these people would just grant a house and, and there would be four or five other students staying in the same house and there would be a leader. They would uh, regularly pray. But this might sound all normal, but when it comes to, to the point that you learn um, the people who run this house, they don't use their real name. So they have code names. They would then be coached towards a particular career such as the military or the judiciary or police. There would be regular prayer meetings with their supervisors. They would be provided with exam answers by Gulenists already on the same career path, or given tips on how to fool the secular military, which would have been on the lookout for them. According to a 2009 WikiLeaks cable, written by the US Istanbul Consulate General Sharon Wiener, one tactic for ferreting them out is to hold a pool party where military officers are expected to bring their wives, thus exposing the pious women who refuse to wear a swimsuit to the detriment of their husbands' careers. Kongar, however, noted Gulan supporters have begun to act in a secular manner to protect their identities. For example, while a secularist's wives attend pool parties with one-piece suits, Gulanist wives will wear more revealing two-piece swimsuits. She also mentioned stories of pious officers stalking their house and trash with alcohol bottles to fool the ever-vigilant inspectors seeking to root out non-secular officers. Recruits continued to be supervised in their careers under what's become known as the Arbi system. Arbi is the Turkish word for elder brother. For example, each Arbi supervised at least one person in the military the Arbys would not work in the military, but always have a job outside, so those inside wouldn't necessarily know who their Gulenist colleagues were. Their Arbys would operate under a code name, and the hierarchy would remain outside the military. If you just go back to the Kemal Batma's you know, footage and how he is very relaxed with these people, he's touching their shoulders, like there is no this, you know, uh, military discipline in that airbase. Like these, these people only know, know each other and their friends and they're doing something because even in coup attempts you would have a hierarchy but in this coup attempt you see that there is no hierarchy other than that some you know key people telling people what to do other examples emerged after the failed coup this is kamal ishikla who was an official at the banking regulation and supervision authority in his statement he admitted to being an arby for the commandos the group that was sent to the resort of marmaris to find the turkish president 
This is Levent Turkan, who used to be an aide to the former head of the military, Belusi Akar. He was involved in detaining his boss on the night of the coup. He later admitted receiving the answers for his military exams from an army known as Sirdar, and bugging the office of Akar's predecessor at the request of an army called Murat. This is how they operate. Like, you wouldn't get um, hard evidence from villain organization because, you know, you can be a general in a military, in a Turkish military, but there might be someone who might be just a cleaner in the same institute and he might, he, he might be your superior. That's how they uh, supervise their operations and how they, have they, have they disguise their uh, operations as well. And that's why officials believe Adil Uksuz and Kemal Batmas were at Akinja Air Base, both high-level followers of Fethullah Gulen. At that time, they were thought to be very senior imams, responsible for the head of the military's office and also the Air Force. And that's why evidence from witnesses about important negotiations at this complex could appear plausible. It was also here in Ankara that some of the highest level meetings took place just before that coup attempt was made. Investigators believe that Adel Uxas rented one of these villas in this exclusive gated complex where he could meet senior officers from the military. According to statements gathered by investigators, Uxas discussed how the coup would be executed and which locations would be targeted as the time for the coup drew nearer. The decades in which the Gulenist organization grew were dominated by the Turkish military, a staunchly secular organization that often intervened in politics, carried out coups and tried to limit the practice of religion in public life, an atmosphere which Fethullah Gulen was able to exploit by impressing people with his aspirations and apparent piety. Hussein Guleja was a prominent Gulenist for more than 20 years. He says he was never part of Gulen's inner circle, but did attend public events with him. Now he's cut all ties and regrets ever joining. I used to be a member of Turkey's War of Independence Association, which is a very nationalist, idealist group. It was made up of intelligent young people who were against leftist ideas. The aim is to instill them with domestic and national values, to be raised for high-ranking positions in the state. During these times, I discovered the teachings of Fethullah Gülen. He was talking to young people. He called them the golden generation. I thought he was doing the same thing we were trying to do in the association. That's why I thought we should support him. Hanafi Avja sent his children to Gülen schools. The organization really affected the religious sectors, the conservative thoughts, and nationalist feelings of the Turkish people. The Gulenist support of education for young people created excitement among the Turkish people. Not only them, but also the Turkish government was impressed in those days. Especially their activities overseas, in Turkish countries and in Muslim countries. Their way of working was like the Ottomans. They were like an NGO. They affected all Muslim and Turkish regions. They were taken to the heart of the Turkish people. They created a powerful image. But soon concerns started to emerge. In 1986, the first warning appeared about Gulen in the media. An article in Nokta magazine said 66 students had been expelled from military schools because of links to the Muslim cleric. Concern increased in the 1990s. This article appeared in Milliet newspaper, detailing another investigation in the military that Gulen had met the then Prime Minister Tansu Chilla asking for her support. And this video emerged, recorded in 1986, making his intentions clear. Gerekken 
uçuşlar yaparlarsa dünya başlarını ezer. Ve Müslümanlara Cezayir'deki hadise gibi yeni bir hadise yaşatırlar. Suriye'deki 82 vakası gibi bir fecaat yaşatırlar. Her sene Mısır'da yaşanan fecaat ve fecaat gibi bir fecaat ve fecaat yaşatırlar. Firavunlar çağını yaşıyor. Toprak Firavun bitirmek için pek mümbit. Böyle bir dönemde tam özünüzü bulacağınız, kıvamı ereceğiniz ana kadar, dünyayı sırtınıza alıp taşıyabilecek güce ulaşacağınız ana kadar, o kuvveti temsil edeceğiniz şeyler elinizde olacağı ana kadar, Türkiye'deki devlet yapısı ölçüsüne göre bütün anayasal mühendiselerdeki güç ve kuvveti cephenize çekeceğiniz ana kadar, her adım erken sayılır. There were also indications he was receiving protection from influential circles. In 1997, the government of Necmettin Erbakan was forced out of office in what became known as the postmodern coup. The military forced his government to ban religious schools, but Gulen's weren't affected. A new government was put in its place, led by Prime Minister Mesut Yilmaz under President Suleyman Demirel. His public personality is that he's a very wise and idealistic cleric. He's very careful about his prayers and religious practice. People around him are reminded of the first believers of our Prophet as he sets a good example. His personality affected so many people in Turkey, including political figures, even those from different political parties such as Demiral, Ecevit, Mesut Yilmaz, Tansu Tillar, everybody was affected. By now, Guleja was established as a writer at Zaman newspaper, one of the main media outlets for Fethullah Gulen. He eventually became its general manager. When I look back on it now, I used to present an acceptable face for the organization. Because you're working in the media, leading a newspaper, you talk with other parts of society, you're doing television programs, you're attending meetings to represent journalism associations. Academics, journalists like myself attended those meetings. We all thought that it was like a movement, an NGO. They care for young people, they gave scholarships to poor students, they opened dormitories for them. Even more importantly, Turkey had a polarization problem that resulted in fighting between left and right. We need a dialogue to end this. These meetings were helping us to address those issues. Fethullah Gülen was holding these meetings. One man who was already acting on his suspicions was Nuhmete Yüksel. He was working as a prosecutor in the state security court and became the first lawyer to open one of several cases against Gülen. They portrayed themselves as enemies of Turkey's first leader, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. So their hatred against Atatürk provoked me and I started investigating them. When they entertained guests, they were hanging Atatürk's photographs or statues temporarily. Then, when their guests left, they hid them. Gülen's moves and thoughts were always for capturing the Turkish state and destroying it. For example, he has speeches where he deliberately orders the capture of the state. He said, capture the state, capture the army, capture the judiciary, and capture the civil service. These were showing that he is a terrorist. Yüksel started planning his first case in 1999, the same year Gulen left for the US for what he called health reasons. Gulen never returned, but three years later, Yüksel lost his job. A sex tape was released to the media, a plot subsequently blamed on the Muslim cleric. By 2006, all the cases against Gulen had been dismissed. The two judges that dismissed them were arrested later for being Gulenists. When I first started my investigations, some of my friends were against me. In time, they learnt about Fethullah Gulen, and they saw that I was right. Today, they all side with me. All Kemalists and nationalist people side with me. In the following years, two cases dominated Turkey, Balyoz and Ergenekon, both alleged widespread secular plots to overthrow the government after Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the Conservative Act Party came to power. 
Hundreds were jailed, including the head of the military. They're now regarded as attempts by Gulenists within the legal system to remove their opponents using fake documents and abusing the judicial process. Most of those jailed have now been released. Hanafi Avja was one of those accused of being involved in Ergenekon and of being a member of an illegal leftist terror group. He had already complained to government officials about Gulen. He became so frustrated, he published a book criticizing him and his followers. A month later, he was behind bars. These incidents developed so rapidly that I had no time to think. I was brought to Istanbul in a wink. However, I didn't want to come to Istanbul. I knew this was illegal. To take a stand, I didn't reply to their summons. So they arrested me in Ankara and brought me to Istanbul. The trial took just three or four hours. They sued me in four different courts, but also sued me in over a dozen cases. The police also started investigating me. They turned every topic that I wrote in my book into a crime. I think I was dismissed from my profession ten times and expelled from the civil service. They sued me in professional discipline cases more than 20 times. I was dealing with all these while I was in prison. By the end of 2013, it all came to a head. Protesters took to the streets and the authorities finally began to realize the extent of the organization's activities. Dozens of people linked to the ruling ACT party were detained in a corruption inquiry. Businessmen, relatives of politicians, allegations against Erdogan's family, in what was seen as an attempt by the Gulenists to bring down the government. It resulted in the dismissal of more than 300 police officers. Son 40 yıl içinde oluşmuş faaliyetlerini çok büyük bir gizlilik içinde yürütmüş. Lideri de Pennsylvania'da bulunan bu çete devlet kurumlarına sızarak iç ve dış politikamızı etki altına almaya hatta çok açık bir yargı darbesi gerçekleştirmeye yaten. Faaliyetlerini eğitim ve insani yardım görüntüsü altında sürdüren bu örgüt gerek Türkiye'de gerek faaliyet gösterdiği kimi ülkelerde devlet ve siyaset üzerinde etkili olma hedefini gidiyor. Örgütün uluslararası istihbarat örgütleriyle de işbirliği bulunuyor. Ve buna ilişkin de somut deliller ortaya çıktı, çıkıyor. Bu tehlikeli örgüt karşısında tüm ülkelerin dikkatli ve hassas olmaları gerektiğini burada bir kez daha hatırlatmak istiyorum. Hüseyin Gülerce was still at Zaman newspaper. At that point he said he realized Gülen was fighting against the government after an argument over a tweet he wrote. Benim ülkemin başbakanını yabancılar götüremez. I said that my country's prime minister cannot be removed by foreigners. He can only be removed through voting at a party meeting or if citizens decide during elections. The same afternoon, Zaman editor-in-chief Ekrem Dumanlı called me and asked me to delete it. I told him, you guys are exaggerating everything, and if it goes like this, they'll be fighting, and I am not deleting it. Then Sherif Ali Tekalan called me from Pennsylvania in the US, just 15 minutes after. He's a professor. He works as a rector at one of their universities. He said, we are kindly asking you to delete that tweet. I became really suspicious. My tweet was being taken personally by Gulen himself. I'm saying foreigners cannot remove my prime minister and Fethullah Gulen thinks I'm addressing him. And he's right. I said to Sherif Ali Tekalan that I'm not deleting what I wrote. Then just 10 minutes after, again from Pennsylvania, Zaman owner Alaat Dinkaya called. He said, I'm talking to you now while Fethullah Gulen is beside me. He made sure that I understood that Gulen was standing next to him. He said, you need to delete that tweet. I repeated that I'm not deleting it. Since that moment, I've never talked to Gulen. They've never called me again. At that moment, I closed the book on Fethullah Gulen. It was then that the fight against the Gulen organization really started in Turkey. Businesses related to the organization, such as Kainak Holding, began to be seized. Gulen followers were removed from positions of responsibility, but not many people foresaw a coup. Yahya Boston is a Turkish journalist and channel coordinator for TRT News. 
He's written a book on how the Gulenist network tried to remain secret, as pressure mounted and investigations continued. He documented their development of a mobile messaging app called Bylock. Bylock is an app that connects the members. The organization wants to be connected. It covers the base of the organization. There are teachers, students, prosecutors, judges, police, and other occupational groups using this app. They created several groups, and they created groups like their cell structure. The majority of people connected to the organization were using this app. Intelligence officials first heard about Bylock from a network member in June 2014. It was the same year it became available online and in app stores. The information resulted in the investigation of almost 200,000 people. Bylock was presented as if it was a commercial product. The owners seemed to be an American. All the conversation on its website was in English. All announcements were made in English, as if it had nothing to do with Turkey. It was presented as if it was established in the U.S. for totally commercial purposes. But after it was hacked, it wasn't like this at all. We saw that all the users of Bylock were Turkish. All the account names were in Turkish, and there were all Turkish codes. Also, the owner was normally using English and then started using Turkish when he spoke to the hackers from the intelligence services because he was panicking. It took so long to decipher these messages because they used three different codes. I remember this was the content of the first message that was discovered. When you are arrested, there are things you should do. If you are going to meet at someone's home, don't take your phones with you. Check your back to see if you're being followed. Don't say everything out loud. Even Adil Uxas was found to have an account, which he used to send messages to motivate and encourage Gulen's followers, although he didn't use it to organize the coup attempt. A lot of people were using this application. I personally knew people who were using it. For example, imagine a journalist colleague of yours who came up with really good stories about Fetu is accused of using Bayla. After he's taken to court, where he confesses everything, you are shocked. I witnessed this a lot in Ankara. He was a successful reporter. He was finding good stories about FETO, stories that criticized the organization. We learned that he was one of them after his Bylock usage was revealed. He went to court and then he confessed everything, that he used to stay at their houses, that he is with them, that he cooperates with them. It is shocking to see someone you know in person and who you don't expect to be connected to FETO, to be actually working with them. It turned out that there are so many people like this. Some of them committed crimes, some of them just took instructions from the organization. The latter, they just gave their testimonies and they are released. It's not the case that everybody who has Bylock is jailed. Journalist Hande Firat also explains how it wasn't always easy to identify Gulenists in everyday life. You wouldn't understand if he or she was a Gulenist at first glance, if he or she was not well known. But as you start speaking, as the conversation continues, you can understand his or her ideology, the way they look into basic problems in Turkey if they don't hide their identity. But there are some who hide their identity, so it is not possible to recognize them. For example, if a teacher says he would go anywhere in the world if he is told to, leaving his family behind, you would definitely understand that this is a member of FETÖ. They can go to Africa if they have been told to, without any concerns about their future, career or family. But there are some people who do the reverse. For example, there is also a type of Gülenist that drinks alcohol to hide his identity, who defends or stands against a particular viewpoint very enthusiastically. It is impossible to detect whether these people are Gülenists or not. I was shocked about some people after I learned they were Gülenists. The Gülen network was also capable of creating more confusion about its members. Other applications were produced, and when they were downloaded or used, they would divert users to Bylock servers and put them also under suspicion. 11,000 people were wrongly prosecuted, but then removed from the investigations.
Bylock was eventually taken out of app stores in November 2014 over security issues, although it was still being passed on between Gulen followers. Turkish intelligence officials started their first hacking operation in March 2015. By February the next year, Bylock had been successfully hacked and data recovered. It was also the same month Gulenis stopped using it for good, just five months before the coup attempt. By the time the coup night arrived, Bylock was no longer in use. A small select number were using another service called Eagle, of which little is known, and whichever other messaging services they could get their hands on, like WhatsApp. But not everyone kept quiet. A month before, this university professor and Gulenis made this broadcast from the United States. Ankara'daki manzara şu, ben profesör olacağım ama keşke bir albay olsaymışım mesela, bu süreçte daha fazla katkım olurdu. Nasıl, nasıl katkınız olurdu? Söyledim bitti artık, yani geri dönmeyecektim cümlelere. Bir albay olacaktım ben, tamam mı? Bu ülkeye daha fazla hizmet ederdim şu an. And when the network's newspapers and man was closed down in October 2015, nine months before the coup, a rather cryptic advert was released, featuring an air raid siren and a newborn baby. This is the house where Fethullah Gulen now lives in the United States. He left Turkey in 1999 for health reasons, but also just as legal action was starting against him. He now has a green card, which allows him permanent residence in the United States, and is still able to direct the organization from there. Hussein Gulerja has been to Gulen's home several times. His house is in that property, but they've also built a modern building. There are also two-story buildings for guests. They always have visitors. Almost every day at least 10 or 15 people who were visiting from Turkey stay there. People who live in the States visit too. Also academics and students visit him every weekend. There is a strict discipline at the property. He has his own private security. Interesting enough though, those security people are not known as bodyguards. He brought them in from Turkey. After Gulen started to live there, Americans provided green cards for those whoever he brought in. He was leading all the activity that takes place in Turkey from there, and very comfortably too. As a prominent journalist in Turkey, Hande Firat was also invited. They were the main power in the media. They were putting journalists in contact with Fethullah Gülen. They used to organize trips, they were taking people to Gülen, his schools abroad, and they were hosting journalists there and representatives of non-governmental organizations. Since I knew what kind of man he is, I never went and met him, never interviewed him, although I was invited numerous times. They even came to me personally and told me that I can send my daughter to their school. I politely refused. I told them I am a Tevfik Fikret graduate and my daughter is studying there. You might not know, Tevfik Fikret is a private Kemalist school. So if you recognize and know them, you adjust your behavior based on that. But I have worked with them throughout my career. Just like we were invited to conferences, meetings as journalists, they were invited to these places as well, and we were working side by side. For the past three years, Turkey has been trying to obtain his extradition without much success. Matthew Breiser is a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and White House official. He dealt with Turkish-American relations for eight years until 2009. He says people in the United States have problems understanding what happened. People you know, who are concerned about international affairs generally believe still that it was not. Maybe it wasn't a real coup attempt. Maybe it was all engineered or taken advantage of by the Turkish government to try to go after its opponents. 
uh, political opponents and maybe using uh, this Gulen movement as a scapegoat. They don't know anything about the Gulen movement. Fethullah Gulen is an obscure person they've never even heard of until you know July of 2016. Um, and so um, for them, for your average educated American, it's, it's a story that's very difficult to absorb, to comprehend. It sounds so conspiratorial. Now, there's this man, a recluse somewhere in the Poconos Mountains of Pennsylvania who could somehow engineer a coup attempt in Turkey. They think, how could this be true? Except it's true. <laughs> but as Ragib Soylu points out, few in Turkey have such doubts. If you, if you talk to the Turkish people, 90% of them would say that Gulen is responsible. And if you, if you talk to the fierce Turkish government, uh, op opposition, uh, or uh, the journals who, who were imprisoned by under this government, they would tell you that Gulen is responsible because he is responsible. And it's kind of very hard to tell the world how they operate because any attempt to describe Gulen movement's activities in, a, in an objective way, just face the accusation of um, being propagandistic or um, just kind of political uh, vengeance way of dealing things. The, the main issue, there, there are two, risk, two uh, aspects of the issue. One of them is the legal aspect, and, and it just depends on the US courts. And if you talk to the American officials, as I, as I said, they, they're just looking for a phone call, a written note, uh, sometimes uh, logistical intelligence, such as showing Fethullah Gulen somehow meeting some people if you don't even have the tapes or recordings, maybe, you know, based on cell phone uh, reception, intelligence, etc. But Turkey doesn't have it because Turkey is not operating, doesn't have intelligence operations or uh, police operations in the United States. It all depends on United States government. And the United States government, as I s said earlier, just says that they stopped tracking Fethullah Gulen early 2010s, so they don't have any evidence backing up Turkish claims. And um, so it's kind of a stalemate. However, as revealed in WikiLeaks cables, US diplomats had warned about him. James Jeffrey, who used to be the US ambassador to Turkey, wrote in 2009. The Gulen movement's purported goals focus on interfaith dialogue and tolerance, but in the current AKP secularist schism, Many Turks believe Gulen has a deeper and possibly insidious political agenda, and even some Islamist groups criticize Gulen's lack of transparency, which they say creates doubts about his motives. The assertion that the Turkish National Police Force is controlled by Gulenists is impossible to confirm, but we have found no one who disputes it, and we have heard accounts that police applicants who stay at Gulenist pensions are provided the answers in advance to the police entrance exam. The same year, the Istanbul Consul General Sharon Wiener wrote, Another group that sparked the ire of the Kemalists are the followers of the religious leader Fethullah Gulen. Our contacts all agree they are everywhere in Turkish society, including the strongest bastion of Kemalism, the military. There's not much that the U.S. government could do. In fact, there's nothing the U.S. government could do to, to stem the infiltration of Turkish governmental institutions. Uh, what could have happened would have been uh, some sort of legal investigations of the Gulen movement. And there was concern uh, about whether or not the Gulen, Fethullah Gulen himself could be seen as a threat to U.S. national security. His writings were seen as exactly the sorts of things we, we would like people to think about the compatibility of democracy and Islam and how there's no clash of civilizations between East and West. Uh, but still, we were receiving complaints from the Turkish government that he might have terrorist intentions. So there, there were a couple of investigations done back then in the aftermath of September 11th uh, into whether or not there was sufficient evidence suggesting that he could pose a terrorist threat and should be deported. And obviously those investigations didn't conclude in a deportation uh, order. Now the focus seems to be on more than 150 schools linked to Gulen in the United States, about its activities there, how they raise money and win support. A source of friction which never seems to go away for Turkey and the United States, as shown by a visit by Donald Trump's wife to a school founded by the network in Oklahoma. 
I do think the U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI uh, have been investigating, as I said before, the Gulen organization uh, as potentially uh, violating all sorts of U.S. laws, uh, visa applications, visa fraud, uh, it could be wire fraud as well, uh, strange ways donations have been made to individual political candidates uh, around the United States, uh, and then serious questions about the, the charter schools of the Gulen Network. There have been some strong documentary films made about that as well. And so I think the FBI is following up on all that stuff. The question now remains for Turkey whether the United States can still be persuaded of his guilt that it was directed by Fethullah Gulen himself and not staged by the government or only by disillusioned secular members of the military. The military is not only the most beloved institution in Turkey, but the most disciplined by definition. <laughs> if you're a military officer, you have to follow and, and give out discipline. So without some sort of massive conspiracy, it would be, in my mind, impossible to convince a sufficient number, a critical mass of senior military officers to do something as radical as bomb the parliament building, strafe the streets, order tanks onto the bridges here in Istanbul and, 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 to, and to kill people. Um, that requires a level of commitment that for me can only come from some sort of other large organization that has pulled the whole thing together. Fethullah Gulen has now been in the United States for 20 years and extradition efforts have been continuing since 2016. The United States seems to be waiting for the smoking gun, the one piece of vital evidence that links Gulen to the coup. But there does seem to be a huge amount of circumstantial evidence which points in his direction and which Turkey believes should be investigated.